Good morning, everyone. We're glad that you're here at Cross and Crown Baptist Church. We're excited to worship the Lord this morning. Let's go ahead and grab our hymn books, if you would, and let's turn over to hymn number 445, hymn 445, Standing on the Promises. And you can't be sitting down singing this one, so you got to stand up with me here. Let's sing it out on that first verse. Standing on the Promises of Christ my King. Thank you. 
It's so great to have you out today. And if you're visiting with, with us for the first time today, a special welcome to you. We want you to feel at home as we join our hearts together to worship the Lord. And uh, we'd like to put a welcome packet in your hands. I know some folks have been here before, um, passing through uh, a year ago or so, and uh, we welcome you back. But if you did not receive a welcome packet with one of our connection cards and information about the church, just raise your hand and one of our ushers will get one of those to you. Anyone like that? Okay, great. Let me go over a couple announcements before we uh, get into the worship service this morning. Um, I'm going to place this on the back counter, and uh, with, it's just referenced a little bit in the bulletin, but to this bright yellow sheet of paper is um, some of the men in the church said, Pastor, we'd like to volunteer to help with some things, and I said, yeah, I've got some things to do. Let me just sit down and write them down. Well, I wrote them down, and it turned out to be a whole sheet of paper here with a lot of projects to do. We're not going to be scheduling a work day as such because many times people can't make it out on that, uh, that time. But you are free at other times you'd like to help out. Uh, so I have um, all of these things that are on here that you can volunteer to help. And uh, we'll be doing some other major projects, some minor projects. But we'd really love to get this building and property in beautiful tip-top shape so that we can sell it. And why do we want to sell it? Because we're getting very, very close to being having our plans completed uh, for the new building that's going to be on the six acres just around the corner. And uh, so we want to be able to uh, make this one look really ready. So we'll put this. Grant, will you go ahead and do that at uh, some point during the service? Just take that, put on the back counter. Thank you. Uh, ladies, uh, it's getting much closer to uh, these conferences coming up. The first one is a one-day conference in uh, South Haven Baptist Church down in Springfield on September 15th. And uh, as it's mentioned here, registration uh, is a little bit higher now because it's getting closer to the date. And, uh, but you can still go. We'd love to have a lot of folks go. We have about 30 ladies signed up. We'd love to take a lot more. You don't have to be a member. We'd just love for you to go and get spiritually refreshed and recharged at that event. Then also, there's one that's not listed in here. It was in last week's bulletin, but we'll put it into the next one. It's a ladies' conference down in Florida uh, the first few days of November. And there, it's a little bit further away. It's over a few nights, so it's a little bit tougher to get to. But I'd like to ask our men if you could make it happen for your wife and just try to work it out for the, the children, taking care of them, and all the, all the rest that they do. It might be good for you, too to find out what they do <laughs> and find out it's, they don't have life easy. They've got quite a job, a lot of responsibility, and they need that time. So let me encourage our ladies to be able to get together. Miss Kim's going to load up the van and uh, go cruising on down there. And uh, 15 passengers, she'd like to fill it up with luggage and ladies and get on down there for that spiritual time. Okay, I think that's it for uh, those announcements. Let me just mention uh, two things. We're going to have a business meeting tonight, two very short, simple uh, things that the church needs to vote on for our quarterly meeting, and things are exciting with what God is doing and is going to do here with Cross and Crown Baptist Church as we move forward with uh, trying to increase the kingdom of God. So you come out tonight. We'll have that right after the evening service. I'm, I'm more excited also about the message that God put on my heart about prayer. And I preached on prayer in many different ways. The Bible addresses it in, in hundreds of different ways. But the message tonight on prayer I'm excited about. I want you to be able to be here and learn about it. Because what does it do for you when you pray and God doesn't answer the way that you asked him to? Did you pray wrong? Is God judging? He said, you have not because you ask not. So um, we're asking, God, why aren't you answering? So the Bible addresses that, and I want to share that with you with a message, uh, especially tonight, okay? Our college students are heading off, and they will be, um, many of them, one already took off, Carissa took off this week to Ambassador Baptist College. Several others are heading back to college uh, this week. So make sure you spend some time talking with them, shaking hands, giving them a hug, and uh, telling them that you'll be praying for them. And uh, we were just desperately going to miss them all uh, as they take off. Uh, this next week. In just a few moments, uh, we'll have our offering, and let me just tell you right now to get prepared. Um, we would like to do something special in our love offering this week, and then next week, um, since you might not be prepared this week, perhaps you could prepare and pray about it and see God provide, but there is a need uh, for one family in our church, 
and that's Pastor Lucas. And Pastor Lucas has been getting, uh, and he's in the room, so I can talk about him because he can't hear me right now. <clears throat> oh, I think he did. He's, he's giggling back there. <laughs> Pastor Lucas is in need of hearing aids. And for the last couple years, I have been, uh, uh, you know, talking to him, and he's leaning closer and closer and then asking more questions, and I'm realizing, I think you need to get a checkup. And uh, he, uh, he, he is in need of these hearing aids. And uh, I talked with our deacons and our trustees, and we just said, you know, that's what we want to do as a church. We want to step forward and be able to help him get some really good hearing aids. So uh, if you can add to that in, in your tithes and your offerings today when we take up the offering, um, that will be going to, to him to help him. If you can't this week, we'll do it as, as well next week, okay? All right. I love being part of God's family and God's church. It's just a joy. Let's pray and ask for God's blessing. Lord, we want to worship you today and all that is said and done with the music and the singing and, and the lifting of, of uh, your name and glorifying you. Father, we love you and we, we praise, praise you thanking for the Lord Jesus Christ. You sent the Son to be the Savior of the world and I am a recipient of that love. I'm a recipient of the blood that was shed to pay for my sin. I'm truly blessed and I praise you for each who are of these who are here today that have come with a desire to praise you, Lord. And I pray that, God, you would, you would truly be glorified in all that is done. And, and, Father, we cannot please you without faith. It's impossible to do that. So we ask you in faith that you'd help us to empty ourselves of the sin and pride, humble ourselves to say, Lord, I need you more than anything else in this world. I need you. And I pray that you would show us wonderful things from your word today. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. today in our services let's flip over to a chorus chorus number 636 i'll live for jesus we'll sing this one and then take some time to welcome everyone to the services go ahead and stand with me if you would sing it out here
Amen. As we go ahead and receive our offering at this time, it's a time when we just praise God for how he has blessed and prospered us, and we rejoice in his goodness, not only in his mercies and his grace, but how he's provided for us, and it's just a joy to be able to worship and give back to him. And so we'll go ahead and receive the offering. If the men will come, I'll ask Brother Ryan if you would just give thanks to God for our offering today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, your mercy and your grace towards us is new every day. And Lord, don't take that for granted. Lord, we thank you for salvation you've given us through Christ. Lord, please uh, open our hearts as we open your word. Accept tithe and offering. Turn to him 443, if you would. Hymn number 443, He Hideth My Soul. You can stay seated for this one. We'll sing this hymn right before our message here today. Hymn number 443. I'll jump in on that chorus together on the second, ladies. Here we go.
right, guys, on the third, just you on the third. With numberless blessings, each moment he crowns, and filled with his fullness divine, I see. are all going to drop out, and we'll just do that chorus a cappella. On the fourth, here we go. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds in the sky. His perfect salvation is I'll shout with the millions of There's a ministry to the heart in music, amen? God loves to hear us lift His praises. Dealing with um, our architect and the engineers for the design of our new building, it's been very important to me that we create the proper setting to where we can have congregational singing. You know, churches being designed today are not designed for congregational singing. They're not at all. The acoustic value, um, the layout, everything is designed for entertainment, where worship is driven from a platform into the heart of people. I, I don't want that kind of building. Now, we're independent Baptists. We'll use whatever building we got. But if we have a chance to design it, then we want to create it to where all the voices, some sweet, some artificially sweet, <laughs> can praise God. Amen? And we can, we can hear each other and just the joy that it is it to God. It's, if if it, it makes me that happy, boy, what does it do to God to hear the voices of His people just lifting praise to Him? That, uh, that one day that I will rise and be transported out of here and see my Savior and we'll be singing all the way. Amen. We're down to our last message on the life of David. And so we find David here in 1 Samuel I'm sorry, 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. We've been in Samuel. And David is going to pull his son Solomon aside and share with him his last words. Paul did this when Paul knew it was revealed to him through the Holy Spirit that he was about to die. And there in 2 Timothy, the very last epistle that Paul writes, he writes in chapter 4 
that I know in my time has come, and I want to give you my, my last few words, and, and you've got to hang on to them, Timothy. What a privilege it was to be that son in the faith of, Tim, uh, of Paul. And, and he said, I'm, uh, I've been able to be used of God, and I want God to use you too, and God can use you if you just will listen to me. And these are my famous last words. What would your famous last words be? You ever thought about that? I mean, we're, we're young, we're living life, we don't take the time to think about our last words. But let me ask you today, think about that. What would be the words that you'd like to pass on to those people who are coming behind? I wrote down a few famous last words. Some of you may remember Pistol Pete Maverick. Remember him? He, was, uh, he loved basketball. He was a fireball, and he was in a pickup basketball game when he collapsed, and someone ran over to him, and his last words were, I feel great. Some of you know Ludwig, Ludwig von Beethoven. No, maybe not. Maybe you didn't live with him at the time he lived, but you've heard of him. And he said, I will hear in heaven. Civil War Union General John Sedgwick spoke to his men who were fighting in battle and they were ducking from the fire of a Confederate sniper. And his last words were, they couldn't hit an elephant at that distance. <laughs> He's down. Surgeon Joseph Henry Green lay dying on his deathbed with his hand on his wrist checking his pulse and his, his last words were, it stopped. <laughs> <laughs> He died. Murderer James W. Rogers, while standing before a Utah firing squad, was asked if he had any final request, and his last words were, Yes, bring me a bulletproof vest. <laughs> Here's David. He's giving his last words. Look with me in chapter 2 of 1 Kings. The days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon, his son. Now, what does Solomon mean? Shalom, Solomon, peace. His son of peace, and he wants his son to live in peace. He charged Solomon, his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Everybody dies. And I'm going that way right now. And you too will die one day, everyone on earth. So, when I die, he says in verse 2, be thou strong. Therefore, show thyself a man. Now, Solomon was 20 years old. And when you celebrated your 20th birthday, would you think that you were ready to take over the most powerful nation on earth? All the responsibility of knowing how to judge God's people according to God's word. And he says, verse 3, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. That the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth, with all their heart, with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel." There are a few more verses that he shares with Solomon, which we'll get into in the message. But think about those words. If you gathered your family around your deathbed and you had one last thing to say, what would you want them to know? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we open your word and we thank you for this story that is genuinely true and real and accurate and You've included it from this vast story of the life of David for our purposes. As we look at David's last words, I pray that you would help us to hear from you, Lord. You are the Lord of our life. We surrender to you. We pray that you'd open our eyes, that you would guide us into all truth by thy spirit. I pray, Father, that you would anoint my lips and that you would help me to be able to communicate this passage in a wonderful, respectful way that you would be pleased with. And I pray that you would Please help us to make spiritual decisions for you today. In Jesus' name, amen. He goes on and he says, Solomon, I want you to do a couple things. I'm dying. I want you to get these words. These are my dying words for living life. 
I want you to live life to the fullest. I want you to prosper. I want you to be able to grow and, and be successful. And I have learned, I've been, I've been out there a while, and I've been through a lot of experiences, and you've, I've learned you've got to do what I'm telling you to do. Don't deviate. Don't go to the left hand or the right. Do what I tell you to do. And he tells them just basically two things, and that's our message today. The first one is this. Take care of unfinished business. Take care of unfinished business. Look with me here in verse 5. He says, Moreover, thou knowest also what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me, and what he did to the two captains of the hosts of Israel, unto Abner, the son of Ner, and Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he slew and shed the blood of war in a time of peace. And he put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins and in his shoes that were on his feet. Do thou for according to thy wisdom, and let not his whore, or that means his white-haired head, go down to the grave in peace. He's got three unfinished businesses that he says, I have, I have put on the back burner, and when you become king, I want you to take over and do these things, Solomon. You see, in my lifetime, David was a man of war. His general was a man of war. And, and when his general, Joab, went out and in a time of peace, went up to the generals of the northern tribes, which they were battling, and, and he went there and he slew and he killed Abner, he killed Amasa. This man's got blood on his hands, and I pardoned him during my lifetime, but in your lifetime, you've got to deal with him. Now think about the practicality of that. This man is a rebel. He, he is a disobedient. He's an insubordinate general. He's a murderer in a time of peace. And, and you can't let that go on. Because Solomon, if you want to have a reign of peace, there needs to be a turning of the page. You need to move on from this cloud that is hanging over the kingdom, and that is this man who was an evil leader. He needs to be dealt with, and I'm trusting you, Solomon. Go deal with him. And we find out that Solomon does deal with him later. But the, the principle he's saying is there'll be no peace in the kingdom. You need a fresh start. And so deal with Joab. But he goes on to say in verse 6, I'm sorry, verse 7. But I want you to show kindness unto the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and let them be of those that eat at thy table, for so they came to me when I fled because of Absalom, thy brother. Wow, just one verse. You know, here's David. He's dying on his deathbed, and three people come to mind. He says, you need to, if you're going to move on, and you're going to get a new kingdom of peace, shalom, then you need to deal with Joab. He's, he's an insubordinate general. But I want you to bless Barzillai. He's the guy that when I was fleeing from my own son Absalom, who was usurping authority and kicking me out of my own kingdom and wanted to kill his own father, I was fleeing for my life that night. Barzillai, guy, that old guy, he came out and he took care of me. He provided food. He provided lodging. He provided rest. What a blessing Barzillai was. Now, I want you, in your lifetime, in any way you can, you bless Barzillai. And then he goes on to talk about the third one, Shimei. Anyone remember what Shimei did? Shimei was a rebel. Anyone remember? Raise your hands. What did Shimei do? You guys know, okay? Anybody else know? All of our pastors, <laughs> they know. Go back and read the story. David, on that night that he was fleeing from Absalom, there in the darkness, he's, he crosses the Jordan River and he's, he's heading up this hillside and he's fleeing for his life out of town. And here out of nowhere comes this Benjamite. Remember King Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin? And he saw his opportunity and he was going to say, Ah, there it goes, David. David, you took over the kingdom from my king, King Saul. Oh, David, you're wicked. And he picked up rocks and he threw them at David, the king. And David's general said, Sir, shall I go over there and take off his head? And David said, No, let him curse. Doesn't matter. The Shimei is a picture of a rebel. There are rebels who are against the authority of God everywhere. And I'm telling you what, in this country today, we're surrounded by them. These are people who are rebelling against all authority of any kind, shape, or size, and they want to bring about 
anarchy in our life and in our country. They want to bring wickedness into the mainstream of our society. This is what is happening in our country. I think the Bible is showing us about Shimei because there's these three kinds of people in the world. You've got the, the person that's got to be dealt with. Then there's Barzillai. He is so good. You take what you can and bless him. There's Barzillais out there. But then there's Shimeis. And they're the ones who are starting these organizations and propagating this, this error and this heresy. And they're teaching that we ought to, to destroy these lower cultures and let's create a, a abortion centers and let's, let's get rid of these people. That's, this is what's behind it. And, and they're, they're promoting all of this wickedness and legalizing drugs and saying our culture ought to have fun with all this, to legalize it. Shimmy eyes. Rebels. They're the ones that are out there saying, you need to kill the cops. It's, it's, our society is full of this. And David on his deathbed, I don't know if he was whispering, if his voice was faint, but he said, you know, if you're ever going to have peace in your kingdom, Solomon, you need to take care of unfinished business. And number one, you deal with all those who are guilty and use justice, deal with Joab. And then there are the good people out there. Reward them and bless them and make life wonderful for them. And then there's the shimmy eyes. You need to take care of all of that liberal, false teaching that's out there. You need to do that. If you're ever going to make Israel godly again, then you need to make sure you have peace in the kingdom. Folks, if for peace to reign in your heart, you need to deal with unfinished business. And in your heart, there's oftentimes a lack of peace. You know why? Because we harbor Joab's. There's the guilt. And we pardoned it, and we put it in the back corner, and we carry it around, and you got to deal with it. You know what you've done before God is wrong. You need to get right with God. You need to bow the knee. You need to say, God, I, I, I'm guilty. I have done these sins, and I'm, I'm laying it all out. God, judge it and take care of it and deal with Joab's. Then there's the Barzillais. Yes, you need to do good. God, God says not only refrain from evil, but do good. And how much of our life is, is out there sacrificing of self in order to help others? That's what God wants us to do. Bless the Barzillais. And then, what about the Shimeis? If peace is ever going to reign in your heart, you need to stop the rebellion and completely surrender to the will of God. Wave the white flag. Walk to God and bow down and start all of this with your own heart. This is what he's saying here. If I were to say that to my sons as I lay on my deathbed, it's difficult more these days to get deathbed uh, statements because the way we deal with death and we're compassionate and we provide comfort measures and medication and things like that. It occurs many times and so we don't have as many deathbed statements. But if I were lying on my deathbed, I would say, don't harbor sin. If you're ever going to have anything for God and enjoy life and be prosperous, deal with your sin. Be humble and get right with God, whatever it is. Start a fresh start. Get it, get it gone and, and surrender your heart to the Lord and start fresh. Aren't you, aren't you glad that God allows us to have a fresh start? Amen. Amen. But then the second thing that he tells him is this. He said, as we read on, in verse 8, about Shimei, Behold, thou hast with thee Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite of Baharumi, which cursed me with a grievous curse in the day when I went to Maenam. And he came down to meet me at Jordan, and I swear to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put thee to death with a sword. Now, therefore, hold him not guiltless, for thou art a wise man, and knowest what thou oughtest to do unto him. But his whore head bring thou down to the grave with blood." Deal with it, folks. Deal with that sin that's there in your life and in your heart. Any rebellion, any kind of rebellion needs to be removed for you to have peace. 
don't have any closets hidden, full surrender to our God. But then secondly, it's to have a passion in your life. Now, that's the big word these days. What's your passion? Oh, you got to have passion. He's passionate about this. Well, that's not a new term. That's a very old term, and we see David live it out. Take your Bible, turn to Psalm 132. David reveals for us, Psalm 132, what his passion was. You already probably know what it is. We've referenced this a few times. Psalm 132. David was going through a rough time, and he cries out in prayer. He says, Lord, remember David. <laughs> remember me, Lord. Have you ever prayed like that? <laughs> I know you know me, but God just, I just got, I got to say it, Lord. Have you forgotten me? Lord, remember me. Please remember me and all of his afflictions. How he swore unto the, the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. Surely, and this is what David's passion was in his heart. Surely, I will not come into the tabernacle of my house. I won't go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to mine eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord, a habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Lo, we have heard it in Ephrata, we found it in the fields of the wood. We will go into his tabernacles, we will worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou in the ark of thy strength. God, I want you to stop having to live in that dusty old 400-year-old tent that's out there, that's, that's tearing and rotting and falling down. God, you deserve the very best of best places. And notice what David says, I'm not even going to put sleep to my eyelids until I find out a place for you to rest, God. Why should I rest when the tabernacle of God is not resting? Oh, Lord, rise up into thy rest. The passion of David's life was to bring glory to God. Why should man have fancier places than God's own worship center, right? That's what he's saying. I want you to understand that. Turn back to 1 Chronicles chapter 28. 1 Chronicles 28. 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles, chapter 28. Well, 1st Chronicles 28. You need to have a passion to live for. If I were dying on my deathbed, I would say, sons, deal with sin. Deal with it, because, folks, sin is going to eat you up. If you let it stay there and play with it, if you're going to hide it and you know, bring it out every now and then, keep that sin in your life, it's going to eat you up. You cannot raise a fire-breathing dragon and keep it in the basement. I, I've raised different animals. I had a raccoon growing up, and I raised a raccoon, and I can tell you all about the fun that is. But I would tell you, don't ever try to get a fire-breathing dragon and think you can have fun keeping it in the basement. Because at some time or other, it's going to get you. And you think you can hide it, and you think you can play with it, and you think you can do these things, but it's going to hurt you. So don't, don't have sin in your life. You, when you do sin, deal with it and get it out of your life. But secondly, sons, you need to have a passion you need to have a reason for waking up every morning. And I'm not just saying new, these new kind of platitudes that you get from these motivational speakers. You need to have a passion in your life. You need to get up and have something, some reason to get up and get going. No, let's talk Bible. Amen? What does God want you to do? Here's what God wants you to do. God wants you to have passion in your life and a reason to get out of bed. Right? This is what God wants you to do. Notice in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, let's read a few verses. David assembled all the princes of Israel, the princes of the tribes, the captains of the companies that ministered to the king by course, and the captains over the thousands, the captains over the hundreds, and stewards over all the substance and possession of the king and his sons, and of his sons and the officers, and with the mighty men, with all the valiant men unto Jerusalem. David the king stood up on his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant 
of the Lord, and for the footstool of our God, and had made ready for the building. But God said unto me, Thou shalt not build the house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war, and hast shed blood. How be it? The Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he hath chosen Judah to be the ruler, and of the house of Judah the house of my father. And among the, the sons of my father he liked me, to make me king over Israel. And of all my sons, for the Lord hath given me many sons, he hath chosen Solomon my son to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of, of the Lord over Israel. Now jump on down to verse 9. And thou, Solomon my son, Know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind, for the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all, uh, all the imaginations of thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee, but if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. These two things he wants David to know. He says, you've got to get up as a young man and be strong and fight the sin in your life. Deal with it. Be a man. The second thing I want you to be a man about is you've got to have that passion of glorifying God. God doesn't deserve second best. God deserves the very best. And, and, and you've got to have a passion for that. Give Him your best, the best of your day. Give Him the best of your week, the best of your month, the best of your life. And how do you do that? How do you give God your best? First of all, look with me at verse 9, and we'll go through this very quickly, pointing out a couple words here. He says, know God. Know Him. Now, I went down to a Titans football game yesterday, and uh, I wore a jersey, number 8, And on the back it said Mariota. Now he's our islander. And uh, so I go up to Mariota and I go, how's it? Now for all of our islanders, they know what that means, right? Brother Leroy, how's it? That's Hawaiian for, hey, how you doing, bro? How's it, brother? <laughs> I have his autograph all across my sleeve, Marcus Mariota. I know Marcus Mariota. We're like this. <laughs> I don't know him. He doesn't know me. I think he would, might, might remember because I was that guy that walked up, up to him and out of nowhere, and people don't normally do this. I went, how's it, brother? And he goes, and so he took my wife. She stood beside him, and we took a bunch of pictures. You know, like, yeah, we know Marcus Mariota. Yeah, right, we don't know him. He doesn't know us. A lot of people think they know God. They don't know him. Oh, but I believe in him. I believed in him all my life. Dear friend, I, there have been many people who are just assuredly, pitifully on their way to hell, and yet they know God. How can that be? because they only know Him here. They've heard of Him. They believe in God. They pray every single day. You don't know how many people I've talked to. Oh, I pray, and I ask Him, I am saying I'm sorry for my sin, and I, I, you know, I try to deal with God. I pray every single night. But dear friend, they are not born again. They don't know Him. Dear friend, you need to make sure, make that calling and election sure. Know that you are a child of God. And then get to know your father, to know him. Solomon, it's one thing. You were raised up in a culture and a family where we worshiped God in the temple down there, the tabernacle. And I talked about God all the time. In fact, 51 chapters of the Bible are written about my life, David says. I wrote Psalms to no end. I sang praises to God and I led worship services. I was the evangelist of my day, though I was the warrior king. I was the, I was the the prophet to the people. I was the king. I wanted to be a priest, but I couldn't. But I did everything I could, David said. And Solomon, you, you were raised up in that. And so it's very, very easy for you to say, yeah, I believe in God. And folks, that's not enough. The dying words of Sol, uh, David to his son Solomon were, you've got to know God. 
Look at verse 9 again. Thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father. Do you know God like your father knows God? Do you know him? Do you know his mercy when you've sinned? Have you sensed his mercy where his hand of judgment was there because of God's mercy? He pulled back and his mercy has been extended to us. Do you experientially, personally know God? Do you know His grace when in the hour of trial, when there was no reason why God should ever bless you or answer your prayer, yet God in His abundant grace has showered you with His blessings and your heart overflows and you know, God, I don't deserve this, but you've been so good to me. I can't help but serve you all of my life. Do you know God's grace in the hour of trial? Do you know His provision? When everything has been stripped from you, your health, and only pain steps in to substitute it, and you, indeed, you endure that, do you know that God provides grace? As Saul, who became Paul, besought the Lord three times that this trial and affliction would be taken from his life, and God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Do you know God in His grace? Do you know that when every last farthing has been stripped from your purse, when there is no hope, and there are bills to pay and responsibilities, and, and, and yet to know there is no other resource out there, and you are at the lowest point possible financially, and you cry out to God and say, God, you are my Father, Abba, I cry to you, <laughs> help me pay my bills. And you go out to the mailbox, and there's a check in there that God providentially prepared before you even prayed. And you can say to your sons, do you know Him like I know Him? Do you know His care when your heart is broken and you're overflowing with emotional grief and you know that if you open God's Word and you begin to read and God sends an angel to lift your spirits and it's Jesus Christ Himself, the angel of the Lord, to not only help you get back to the surface, to where your head is again above water, but to where you walk on the water emotionally. To so no matter what the floods or billows of grief may overwhelm your soul, you can rise above the storm to be sustained with His comfort. Do you know Him that way? Do you know His peace that passes understanding? That when the world is confused and they say, your life should be torn apart, what's, what's going on? And you say, it's all right. I'm good. It's all right. I have peace. Do you know his heart? Oh, yes, I know God's heart. God loves all men. Jesus died for all men. <clears throat> Do you know his heart so intimately that it becomes your heart? To where you love all men and you are burdened for the lost. The sinners, the wicked, the evil, the spiteful, the hurtful. Oh, in my flesh. By the way, our flesh is the very first response, isn't it? When someone does us wrong or harm, our flesh is very quick to say, you, I'm going to get you someday. But with, when you have the heart of God in you, to look upon them in pity and to love them, even those who have despitefully used you? Do you have his heart? Do you know his heart? And folks, do you know his power? Do you know the power of God? Oh yeah, I believe it. And why do you believe it? Because I heard somebody tell me that God answered their prayer. And I believe God can, can do great things. Folks, you don't know God until you know that he can answer your prayer. Do you know God? Oh, if I had only but a little bit of breath left, not enough breath to, to preach an old a message for an hour, but to lean and tilt my head across that bed to my family that is there, and I'd impart to my sons these words, don't allow sin to go on, deal with it, you'll never have peace, deal with sin. But secondly, you need to have a passion in your life of knowing God. 
Enough said, right? But I've got more to say because I'm not on my deathbed and I will share. I will go on. How do you do that? Look at verse 9. Know thou the God of thy father and serve him. Oh, folks, you've never lived life until you start serving God. But I'm not a pastor. I'm not a missionary. I'm not an evangelist. Yes, you are. You are all in God's field. You are all laboring for him, and he wants you to serve him because the only other choice is serve yourself, right? But how do you serve God? He says, serve him with a perfect heart. Underline those phrases, a perfect heart. How do you serve perfectly? Well, the word simply means with simplicity. Just simply. I, I love simple jobs, don't you? I don't really like complex things. Sometimes there's too much going on in my head and I get confused and I'm going to do it wrong and then I might have anxiety, I'm going to blow this and it's going to, oh, we're all going to be in trouble. Oh, it's too complex. I like things simple, don't you? Anyone with me on that? I love simplicity. Okay, how do you serve God? With simplicity, that's how you do it. Perfect heart, simple. Paul tells us, flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and I'll show you what that means. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. In 2 Corinthians 1, Paul is writing to Corinth, and he basically opens up a little bit of a window, pulls back the curtains of the inside of his own life. <clears throat> and notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verse 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience. I have a clear conscience. Boy, brother, if you can have a clear conscience before God, what a blessing. He says, I have a clear conscience because basically in simplicity, and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we had our lifestyle, our conversation in the world, and more abundantly to you word. Okay? How did he do it? With godly sincerity. Look at chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Sincerity. You know, sincere and genuine. The word these days everyone's using is authentic. God's looking at our hearts and He says, what else is in your heart? <clears throat> okay, our hearts are full of all kinds of things. That's why we don't have peace. We have thoughts going this direction, thoughts going that direction. We're conflicted and we, we're dealing with this problem over here and this problem over there and we know what to do is right and our conscience is tugging and yelling at us. Don't do that. Go do this. And yet we we're full of despair and, and oh, all of this going on. Folks, your heart is not single. Your heart is crowded. And God says, serve God with a perfect heart. That means with only one thing in your heart. You have to get rid of the other stuff out of your heart. Your heart's not divided. There's no other motives. It's just pure. It's genuine. It's authentic. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus said, If thy eye be evil, it's full of darkness. But if thy eye be single, it should be full of light. Well, that's probably pretty obvious to most of us. We can see that. If you have a problem with your eyes and you don't see well because there's junk in there, you're not going to see well. Your life will be full of darkness, right? So I go to the eye doctor, and I am praising the Lord because I have new glasses which are working. And uh, they're trifocals. I can see here, I can see here, and I can see here. This is so cool. Y'all don't know this, but for the last year, I couldn't read my sermon notes. And you're like, well, that explains it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but I couldn't. I was reading the Bible like this. And uh, I was really having a lot of trouble. I was leading the choir until finally I gave up and said, Brother Matt, you've got to lead choir. Because I was holding the hymn book, the song book, and trying to lead. I couldn't read. Sometimes the choir saw me go like this. So I could finally get things in focus. And so the doctor says, you know, you've got cataracts growing in there. Wow, okay, really? That's what old people get. This must be weird. This is not... <laughs> Cataracts? Are you kidding me? Something's in the eye. 
So I got these new glasses, and like, oh, this is wonderful. So I went back after three weeks, making sure that they were all just right, and I said, this one is amazing. I can actually read the street signs when I'm driving. Okay, <laughs> this is awesome. But this one, it's still, it's just, I, I, I said, you did a fantastic job with the left one. But <clears throat> can, you, can you just recheck this one? And so she said, sit in the chair, sure. And, and I love my eye doctor, and she asked me Bible questions. And so she said, don't make an appointment. Just come on in here, I'll double check. And she looked at it, and she goes, yeah, you know, there's nothing I can do about that. Really? Are you kidding me? She said, get used to it, because it's going to get worse. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it, it cataracts, they grow. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, if your eye is single, your body is full of light. But if your eye is, has something in it, if he calls it evil, that means if it's got a bad problem with it, then your life will be full of darkness. That's the way it is. And apply that spiritually. If you have a life that is 100% simple and pure, and that is my purpose, my passion for living, is to glorify God in any way I can. One thing, and only one thing, single-minded, I will serve God and glorify Him. Your life will be full of light. Yeah, I've had to mow lawns. Yeah, I've had to go out and work additional jobs. Yeah, I've had to do remodeling. You know what? But even in doing all of that, that was totally secondary, a far, far, far distant second. I had one thing. I just want to glorify God. That's what you want to do. But if you allow other things in your life, folks, that's when you start getting confusion and problems and issues and stresses and conflict and you have a divided heart. So he says, serve God with a perfect heart. Also, back in chapter 28, he says this, verse 9, serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. What does it mean to have a willing mind? It means you do it with delight. I, I enjoy that. I, I want to do this. I, I have a willing mind about it. And then... Over, you don't have to turn there, but in 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 29, David tells Solomon about how much he had saved up of his wanting to build the temple. This is my delight. This is my passion. I'm living for this. He saved up 7,000 talents of silver. A talent is 758 ounces of silver times 7,000, 574,564 ounces and today's market value is $15. Don't believe the ads that say silver is on the way up. I preached this message over 10 years ago, at least this illustration, not the same message, but this illustration. And the value of silver at that time was $21. So it's $15 now. Even at today's rate, that's $8,618,000,000 in silver. You could build a nice, nice tabernacle with that, couldn't you? Okay. He also saved up 3,000 talents of gold. One talent of gold is 1,516 ounces of gold times 3,000 equals 4,548,000 ounces of gold at today's current rate of just under $1,200. At least $5 trillion, 457,600,000. He saved a lot, didn't he? Well, he was king. He had it all coming to him. You know, he could have lived far more extravagantly, couldn't he? He could have lived like Solomon. And Solomon was the richest man, the wisest man, although I question that as far as having any guy with a thousand wives. That's one is all you need, amen? <laughs> right? Because when you get one, you get perfection. And you don't need anything more than that, amen? Men? Oh, you bet. You missed it, guys. That's the time. You say, amen. <laughs> David said, yeah, I had all this money coming in, but where did it go? It went into my giving fund. This is what he did. Folks, we, we believe in tithing and giving above your tithe. Last week, we mentioned a whole lesson on tithing and giving from the life of David. We see that here. And let me just reinforce it one more time. God is pleased with that generosity of the heart. That's what he's looking for. He's wanting that willing mind that says, God, it's not mine, it's yours. Have a willing heart and a willing mind. Have a loose hold on the things of this world. And my passion is to serve God. But let me close with these thoughts as we finish. 
in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9. Why do we do this? Why, what are these last words? Know God, serve Him with a perfect heart and a willing mind. But he says this in the halfway through the verse, For the Lord searches your heart. He understands all the imaginations, the thoughts. You see, God knows everything about you. You can't pull one over on Him. Jeremiah 17, 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. God is always evaluating. Why are you doing what you're doing? Because your heart's divided? Because your heart's drawn to selfishness and selfish choices? Or am I going to serve God or am I going to serve self? And he is evaluating everything on that scale all the time. He knows. Why should you serve God with your life? Because God's watching. And he's going to hold us accountable for everything we do. Sons, you need to know that. Daughters, you need to know that. And he finishes it with this thought. He finishes verse 9. He says, If you seek him, he will be found of thee. If you forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Seek God. Seek him. Seek him first. I often said that in college in Matthew 6, 33. Seek, first, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. God is not holding back. God, you seek God first, and he'll, he'll give you everything you need. And so I, all through college, I kept meditating on that. Seek him first. Seek him first. You know, even when it came to thinking about who I should marry, and, and the verse came to mind, seek him first. Seek him first. So <clears throat> it worked, and that's when I knew. I had the, I had the epiphany. Oh, okay, Lord, it's Kim. It's not... It's not all these other women, <laughs> as if there were any. I want to show you Deuteronomy chapter 12, and we'll close with this verse. Deuteronomy 12. Back to Deuteronomy. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for listening closely and intently with your heart. Deuteronomy chapter 12. Verse 2. You shall utterly destroy all the palace, uh, places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. And you shall overthrow their altars, break their pillars, burn their groves with fire, and you shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. What do you, what do you think verse 2 and 3 is a picture of the first thing that God wants you to do. The first thing that David wanted Solomon to do. Root out and destroy the sin that's in your heart. Get rid of it. And then he says, You shall not do so unto the Lord your God, but in the place which the Lord God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither shalt thou come. And thither shall ye bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and your heave offerings of your hand and your vows and your freewill offerings and the, the firstling of your, your herds and your flocks. And they eat there before the Lord your God, and, and ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand unto in your households wherein the Lord thy God hath pleased thee. You know what? Giving is a form of fellowship with God. He goes on to describe what giving is. Giving is not just putting money in the offering plate. Giving is where I am intimately communicating with God, and He is going to be so pleased, and He's going to bless and return, and, and, and I'm going to continue serving God because I love Him. But where do I do that? He says, Get rid of these false gods out of your heart and start seeking me. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all the other things that you need in life will be added unto you. We need more than money in life, don't we? I'm not going to be the, the TV uh, evangelist that's going to be saying, hey, you put money in the offering plate and God will bless you. I'm going to tell you this. You give to God and he will give back. It may not be on the dollar amount, but you will be given everything you need in this life, and others will be envious of what you've got.
God is so good. Dying words for living life. Put God first. You know, it's interesting as I close with this thought. What was David's first words as we started this series some 20 messages ago? The very first words ever recorded in the Bible that David spoke, what were they? Can you remember back? He, he's keeping the sheep with his dad, and his dad says, I want you to go to the war and check on your brethren. They're in, down at the Valley of Elah, and I want you to go down there. So he goes, and he puts the, the sheep with the keeper, and he goes on down, and he, he arrives there at the battle, and there comes Goliath out into the valley, and he defies the armies of the living God. Choose you a man and send him out. And David is, and all of the Israelites were, the whole army was fearful. Oh, no, it's Goliath. And David, David looked around and it's like, what was the first words? He, 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 he goes and his brother says, I know why you came down. You came down because you just want to see what's going on here. And why don't you go back to the sheep? And he looks at them and he says these famous words. Is there not a cause? The very first words recorded of David out of his mouth. I think from his teenage years all the way until he dies, he was faithful to one thing. His heart was pure. His heart was genuine. He never turned back from that one thing. I think what he is trying to say out of his mouth as he dies is, is there not a cause? I look at this world, folks. It's getting worse every day. I'm telling you what, in my devotions this last two or three weeks, I've been getting so discouraged in reading the news and going to God and saying, God, I don't know how to make a difference. I don't know how to make an impact. This world that I knew that I grew up in is gone. It's gone. I mean, the, the respect for authority and for police and, and the hatred and animosity toward Bible-believing Christians and bakers and florists and everything else. I mean, you know, am I going to be able to even have my sons go into the workplace without persecution? And, and I mean, to be a Christian and a child of God, my world is changing and it's discouraging. And the one thing that God's Holy Spirit has lifted my heart with is that one phrase is there not a cause I have to have a purpose for getting up in the morning I have to have a purpose for continuing on tomorrow you know what that one purpose is having a passion to bring glory to God do you have a passion for that if you don't your heart's going to be distracted and busy and off into this and that and then you're confusion and chaos and anarchy in your heart and you want peace don't you you want peace the only way you're ever going to get peace is you've got to deal with your sin and get it out and secondly you need to have a passion for living for god that's it and with those words he died famous last words in 17 25 Peter the Great, the leader of Russia, said his famous last words. Everyone was gathered around, waiting to see what he was going to say, this great world leader who had so much wealth at his fingertips. And they, he's going to speak, and he, with feeble breath, he whispered his last words. Everyone leaned in to write down what it was. Give back everything to, and he died. No one knew where his estate, his empire, and all of his assets, and all of his money was supposed to go. They didn't know. You see, he missed out on passing on to the next generation what he wanted to say. And folks, I asked you at the beginning of the service, what would you want to pass on to your next generation? I think it would just be this.
have peace in your heart, get rid of the sin, and live your life for God. Don't keep thinking you'll say your famous last words on your deathbed. Say it now. Let's pray. Father, as we close, help us to communicate and incorporate these thoughts into our life as we come before you now. I pray that you would help us to make the decisions that we need to make, Father. There may be some here today that your Holy Spirit convicted about their need of salvation because they've known you, they've prayed, and yet they might not genuinely be saved. And Father, that's not a, a shameful thing. That's just tragic, and it's so true all around us. I pray that today, if you have spoken to someone's heart, that they need to make that settled and be sure and make that calling and election sure in their life. I, Father, I pray that they would get that right and they would be saved today. Father, there may be those that are experiencing basic anarchy and chaos in their heart and there is no peace. And Father, you said there is no peace to the wicked. And so... God, I pray that they would deal with sin in their heart and life. They might be your child, born again, but yet harboring some kind of secret thing that they just need to empty out. They need to bring it out, get it out, and lay it before you and be done with it. Deal with the unfinished business that they're, they're having in their life. But Father, I pray that you would spare and save those from tragedy and tragic consequences of sin that lies for them down the road because they have held on to this sin, help them just deal with it, confess it, and get it right today. Father, for those that may need to gain a passion for living, some may be young and setting out on the journey of life, some may be very old and thinking that they are no longer valuable to you, Lord. Father, banish these thoughts from our minds, Lord, that we have every day a purpose for glorifying you. And I pray that you would reinstill in us this passion for you. Be with our family today as they make decisions to surrender their hearts and lives to you, I pray in Jesus' name. With our heads bowed.